Okay. Did you all hear that? That we have a recording in progress? Okay, perfect. <laughs> yes. Excellent. Great. Right. I think we're going to wait for people to connect. So we start. To everyone that's joining, we're just going to wait a few more minutes for some other people and we'll get started. All right. Welcome, everybody. We are going to get started. Um, I'm just going to start with um, introduction, general introduction uh, as well as our guest. Um, so my name is Martina De Mayo, and I'm, I'm the Director of Research Development at Mascure. Uh, and I'm here with Dr. Jenny Hatcher Martin, who is the Director of Movement Disorders. So, here at the We are so excited today to have uh, Jen Schwanborn with us. Um, Jen uh, was born in Germany and he studied chemistry at the University of Essen and later biochemistry at the University of Witten. He completed his doctorate at the Westfalen Willem University in Munster at the Institute of General Zoology and Genetics. Uh, and then Jen uh, worked as a postdoctoral researcher in various projects at the Westfalish Willems Universität in Münster, as well as the Institute of Neuroscience and Academy of Sciences in Shanghai, and the Institute of Molecular Biotechnology and also at the Austrian Academy of Science in Vienna. And from 2009 to 2013, he led his own project at with Falish Willem University in Münster um, as a junior research group leader. Uh, and then since 2013, Jens holds a full professorship in cell and developmental biology at the University of Luxembourg. He has uh, also worked as a project leader at the Luxembourg Center for System Biomedicine um, and conduct research with his own company, Corganet Therapeutics, uh, predominantly on compounds that can be used to combat Parkinson's disease. So we're so excited to have you here, James. Uh, please take it away. Right. Thanks a lot for the introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I try to share my screen. And um, give me a second. Yeah, while you're doing that, Jens, um, for the audience, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat and we'll get to those at the end. All right. Yeah. So thanks again for having me here. It's a pleasure to, to talk about our work in organotherapeutics. Um, so many of the data that I've shown you here are actually from the academic lab and then in a way have been in licensed by the company. So it's going to be at some levels kind of a wild mixture of, of both worlds. And as you can see already here on the first picture, even if you don't get anything scientifically um, out of this talk, at least you're going to see lots of beautiful pictures of organoids. Um, so I think it's really pretty. So, um, so what we're going to work or talk about is our work on using uh, brain organoids, particular organoids of the midbrain, to model and understand Parkinson's disease, and then ideally to use them uh, for developing therapeutics. So yeah, um, just as a, as a disclaimer or as a disclosure, 
So the work I'm going to show you here is um, licensed bioorganic therapeutics. That's two for technologies, know-how, and molecules presented. And then the company, um, as a company, is doing uh, tries to commercialize that and bring it into a therapeutic application. So let's briefly start with an introduction about Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's is um, is uh, characterized by motor symptoms that you probably all have seen already. Um, these include tremor, but it can easily Pedokinesia, rigidity, postural instability, and several others. And this is what is often summarized as Parkinsonism. However, um, these motor symptoms are often preceded by a very diverse set of non-motor symptoms, including sleep disturbances, hyposmia, anxiety, and others. This is very diverse for different individuals. So not everybody has all of these symptoms, but in most cases, um, these symptoms precede the disease and then also are the motor symptoms and then also um, are still there while the motor phase is active. That while on the um, histopathological levels, what's happening is that in a healthy individual, um, dopaminergic neurons have their cell bodies in the substantia nigra in the midbrain, and then they pro project to the striatum where they secrete dopamine. During the disease process, these dopaminergic neurons are lost, they degenerate, um, and accordingly, the projections to the striatum are reduced, there's less dopamine produced, and that actually leads to the motor symptoms. You can see that here also in two samples of sections of uh, post-mortem samples, where uh, you see clearly in the healthy individual, um, the dark staining, which is a neuromelanin of the substantia nigra, which the dark staining gives it the name nigra, while in the PD situation, this is really heavily lost because these cells degenerate. The second pathological hallmark is the appearance of protein aggregates. We know that from other neurodegenerative diseases, for example, like Alzheimer's, well, here these aggregates mainly consist of the protein alpha synuclein, and um, the aggregates occur either in the cell bodies, where they are called Lewy bodies, or in the neurites, and they're called Lewy neurites. Well, these are the two main hallmarks of the disease, and obviously it is our aim to recapitulate these hallmarks in the dish, because only if we are able to recapitulate, we can understand the disease and we can develop therapeutics. So if you look at the risk factors, there's positive and uh, negative factors. Like uh, the, real, the risk factors that increase the likelihood to suffer from the disease are certain genetic predispositions, aging, so it's a very clear association. The older somebody gets, the higher the likelihood gets, as well as environmental factors. This can be pesticides, uh, but also, for example, air pollution seems to play a role. And there's inverse risk factors, or in other words, like protective factors. This is uh, female gender, which is probably associated to certain hormone levels. Lifestyle, obvious things like probably working out, which is good for you, but also things that are probably less obvious. This is uh, consume of uh, caffeine and uh, cigarettes seems to be protective. And there's also genetic uh, factors that is pro are protective. The time course of Parkinson's disease is very well described in a way. Um, typically, we start here at the time point, let's say zero. This is a time point where the patient first time goes to the medical doctor. Typically, this is when for the first time he experienced or she experienced motor symptoms. And um, as you can see here on the red line, at this stage already, um, roughly half of the dopaminergic neurons in the substantia nigra are lost. That means we are actually at a time point where it's called early disease, very late in the progression, half of the cells are gone already. Well, after this first diagnosis and it continues, um, the motor symptoms become typically worse, while also the non-motor symptoms are still active. If we go a bit earlier in time, we see that first non-motor symptoms probably have started 10, if not 20 years earlier. For example, REM sleep behavior disorder or constipation can occur very, very early at early stages in the premotor or prodromal period. At that stage, we also see that probably 10, 20 years earlier, the degeneration of dopaminergic neurons has started already. And actually, we would argue that there is probably things happening at an even earlier stage, probably as early as neurodevelopmental, where at least the um, predisposition, the Anlagen, to suffer from the disease are already set. So this is good and bad news that tells us on the one hand that it probably starts very early, which is probably not good news, but that also tells us that we can intervene very early and um, probably we should focus on that aspect. So if it comes to this new developmental aspect, um, this goes hand in hand with the multiple hit hypothesis. So what we speculate is that during brain development, something like a first hit occurs. 
and the first hit could be, for example, genetic predisposition. So this is just your genetic makeup that could be mutations in any of these genes that are listed here, but it can be also very complex changes in, in the sequence. So it doesn't have to be real mutations directly leading to defects. It can be just a combination of changes in the nucleic acid composition that probably increase susceptibility. This first hit is followed then at later stages by a second hit. The second hit can be simply aging, uh, but it can be also like environmental factors, toxins that I've already mentioned, or for example, brain injury. Like uh, boxers are known to have a higher incidence for Parkinson's disease because they have a frequent traumatic brain injury, uh, which probably contributes to disease onset. This is followed by first non-motor symptoms, heavy loss of dopaminergic neurons, and then the occurrence of the actual motor symptoms. During today's presentation, I, I want to guide you through several um, cases of Parkinson's, particularly of genetic cases. And the first one we probably want to start with is uh, GBA-associated Parkinson's. GBA is, um, is a gene uh, which can uh, have certain mutations and thereby increase the risk for suffering from Parkinson's. And uh, we focus quite a bit on GBA because this is the uh, most common risk factor for Parkinson's. And it is actually, according to newer studies, way more common than what we have sought before. And uh, GBA is also interesting in uh, several other aspects. Like here on the upper left side, you see a diagram where uh, on the y-axis, you see the effect size. It means the risk of suffering from a disease if a mutation in a particular gene occurs. While on the x-axis, we see how frequent this mutation in the population occurs. So on the upper left, we have a bunch of genes. If, if somebody has a mutation in any of these genes, the likelihood to actually get Parkinson's disease is pretty high. While on the lower right side, we have another group of genes um, that are very common or that where mutations are very common, but their contribution to the disease is probably low to medium. And then in the center, there's two genes, GBA and LAC2, that um, show mutations quite frequently but have a significant but not overwhelming contribution to the disease uh, progression or onset. So these are very interesting because they are so common in the population um, that they represent in interesting targets. Furthermore, um, the majority of Parkinson's disease cases is idiopathic. That means we have no clue why these people have Parkinson's. But uh, clinically, Parkinson's caused by mutations in GBA is pretty indistinguishable from the idiopathic PD, which is another reason why we think it might be a good target. On the genetic level, what you see here on the right side, um, there's a GBA gene, uh, which consists of several introns and exons. You see um, the different mutations that can occur, and we're today going to focus on the N3700S mutation. So it's a point mutation, just one amino acid is exchanged. And you also see next to the GBA, GBA gene, there is a pseudogene uh, for GBA, uh, which makes it really complicated if you want to do gene editing, but that's not the topic for today. Um, if you have mutations in both alleles of GBA, our patients then typically our individuals get uh, Gaucher's disease, which is uh, which is a lysosomal storage disorder, while heterozygous mutations, so just mutations in one allele, are a risk factor for Parkinson's. So um, GBA encodes for a protein called glucosyl serobosidase or GKs. Um, this is an enzyme which is in its mature form localized in the lysosomes. And what it does there is it's just catalyzing a single reaction from glucosyl ceramide into ceramide and glucose. So it's a very classical enzyme. It is uh, during production going through the endoplasmatic reticulum and Golgi apparatus. And then, as I said, in the mature form, ends up in the lysosome. If mutations in GBA occur, folding of the protein is affected, so it changes its structure, and that leads to all kinds of issues. On the one hand, uh, membrane fluidity is affected, then the misfolded protein can get stuck into the endoplasmatic reticulum or the Golgi apparatus and thereby cause problems there in the general protein production machinery. And obviously, it leads to uh, dysfunctional lysosomes. Lysosome function is of huge importance to clear defective mitochondria, so in the mitophagy process. And um, hence, if we have defective lysosomes, typically dysfunctional mitochondria can uh, accumulate, which has an impact on energy metabolism, reactive oxygen species, so lots of processes are affected. All in all, the autophagy process, so the kind of the waste removal mechanism of the cells, is affected by defective uh, lysosomes. 
protein aggregation that I've mentioned before occurs, and eventually all that leads to cell death. So having all these background information, um, I try now to introduce you to how we in the dish, in our experiments, model actually Parkinson's disease. So all our work really starts with the patient. So all experiments that we do are patient-specific. They are a priori personalized because it always comes from one particular individual. So we take from those individuals uh, biopsies, typically skin samples, but you can also start with blood. Um, and from there, you get cells like fibroblasts from the skin. Um, they are genetically modified by the overexpression of four transcription factors. They are called Yamanaka factors. These um, really bring back those fibroblasts developmentally into a status that they are very, very similar to embryonic stem cells. So they are pluripotent, having the ability to differentiate into all cells of the body. Hence, we call them induced pluripotent stem cells. From those uh, iPSCs, induced pluripotent stem cells, we do an intermediate step producing neuroepithelial stem cells. These are stem cells that are pre-committed towards uh, brain tissue. In our particular case, they are kind of pre-committed towards the midbrain. And then we differentiate them actually in these midbrain organelles. And that is our main uh, model for all the following work. Just to summarize what we know about midbrain organelles so far, uh, we have described them first time 2017, and then since then continue to work on them. So these are three-dimensional structures. They have a size of plus minus two millimeter in diameter. Um, they are obviously specific for the midbrain, for the human midbrain. So they express all the marker genes of the midbrain. They produce lots of dopaminergic neurons. So these are the neurons that are affected in Parkinson's. They really produce dopamine. So you can just take a medium measure and you measure dopamine in there. They produce neuromelanin. I've, I've told you before, this is what makes the substantia nigra dark. Um, importantly, this is something you would not see in a rodent model, so you cannot see neuromelanin in the mouse. And also in the human brain, you would not see that in the embryo. This just builds up over time. And the fact that we see that in the midbrain organoids makes us quite confident um, that they're actually suitable for, for um, modeling an age-associated disease. Furthermore, we have a high degree of self-organization. So this is not just an unstructured clump of cells, but there's really tissue organization, layering of the cells. Uh, we not only have neurons, but there's also glia cells and other support cells. I come to that later. And we really see neuronal activity. Uh, so these neurons are really firing. And some of them are really firing exactly the way like a uh, dopaminergic neuron in the substantia nigra would do. Like they have pacemaking activity, frequency of about six hertz. So it's really pretty similar to the human brain in many aspects. Still, it is an in vitro model. It is not the real thing, if you will, but we think it's pretty useful. So first question is obviously, can we actually now use these brain organoids to model PD? So since we are used to just work with 2D cell cultures, we really had to adapt the whole procedure for that. And um, the best studied example for really quickly um, studying Parkinson's disease in the dish is treatment with a toxin. And this toxin is 6-hydroxydopamine. This is specifically taken up by the dopaminergic neuron. It's metabolized. Uh, reactive oxygen species are produced. And actually, the dopamine neurons degenerate. So we did that experiment. Based on that, we developed a full uh, automated pipeline, including high-content imaging. That means we have our samples, um, prepare them uh, for, for imaging, put them in an uh, automated microscope. Um, there overnight, pretty much, the, the images are taken. The images are then uh, brought to, to a server where they are taken up by an algorithm for image processing and recognition. And uh, all the features from the images are extracted. Um, like how many cells do we have, how complex they are, where are they localized, which identities, like all kinds of information. Uh, and this is then processed. And just to show you an example, like uh, this is an image of the dopaminergic neurons. Uh, in, in, in gray, you see the marker of the dopaminergic neurons, this is TH. And then the computer algorithm draws a mask around these neurons. This is shown here in red, and we call this TH mask. And from that, we can, can extract the features that I've just mentioned. And yeah, just to show you two examples here, like when we treat these midbrain organoids um, with 6-hydroxydopamine, we see that the percentage of the dopaminergic neurons, uh, so the TH percentage goes down, we have less of these cells, while the fragmentation index increases, meaning the neurons that are still there are more fragmented, which is typically a sign for early degeneration. So in principle, we, we can obviously, uh, with that assay, say, yes, we can model the disease approach in the dish, and we, we developed then around that a real, um, a real pipeline and a machine learning based 
um, algorithm to really make use of that model and analyze, um, well, the, the, the PD associated features in the dish. However, what we actually wanted to do is not the toxin related studies because this is a bit artificial, but really go, as I said before, for a patient specific sample. So the first study that I'm gonna show you today is based on, um, on um, three control lines. These are lines from healthy individuals as well as three lines from Parkinson patients that have a mutation in the N370 in GBA, uh, which is a very specific point mutation N370S. Um, just as, as an information, the third patient here on top has a LARC2 mutation, um, which seems not to have any impact at all. So this patient line behaves exactly as the two other patient lines. Okay, so first thing to, to check is whether really GK's activity, like the activity of the enzyme where we have the mutation is affected. So there's a, a very easy um, um, plate reader assay that we can use. And what you can see is that the activity in the control is significantly higher than in the PD patient, indicating that the GK's function with the mutation there is indeed reduced. Um, as a next step, then we wanted to see whether um, whether the localization of the uh, protein is also affected. I told you it's a lysosomal enzyme, so it should be localized in the lysosomes. And indeed, if you coast in GKs and LAMP1 as a lysosomal marker in a control condition, you have a very nice degree of co-localization. While if you go for the GBAPD patients, this co-localization is very strongly distorted, so we do not see it anymore. The stability of the protein seems to be fine for the initial stages of those experiments. Like if you come at day 15 or day 30, we find as much uh, GKs in the controls as well as in the patients. While if you go for later stages like day 60, we see quite a significant reduction in the amount of GKs. Um, while we're talking about the times here, typically we do majority of our experiments of an age of organics between 30 and 90 days. However, for certain assays, we can even go uh, up to 420 days if that's necessary, but this is really the extreme case. So uh, obviously then we want to first really recapitulate the cardinal feature of Parkinson's, which is a loss of dopaminergic neurons. And this is really quite strikingly reproduced by those mid organelles. We see uh, levels of dopamine are reduced, levels of TH are reduced. So there is less dopaminergic neurons and they produce less dopamine. This is done, this is visible already at day 15 of differentiation and it persists until day 90. It's quite interesting to note is that if you do the same experiment with um, samples or with stem cells from other patients with other mutations, for example, in LAC2 or in alpha synuclein, and if you look at them at day 90, they would look exactly the same. However, the time course, how they get there is totally different. A LAC2 patient, for example, would look pretty, pretty normal for the first months or two, while uh, then there's a decline. A synuclein patient would have probably at day 15 even more dopaminergic neurons, and then a very sharp decline starting at day 50, day 60. So although we have always the same endpoint, the trajectory, how to get there is very different. And that tells us a lot that we really have to look at these patients as individuals, or at least as, as, as subgroups, stratified groups that need probably very personalized, very specific approaches. Um, we see this loss of dopaminergic neurons, not only in biochemical assays, but also in images. So even if you don't use complex image recognition algorithms, you can see the controls where we have the dopaminergic neurons in red have way more of these red staining than the three patients here. So this is very obvious, very striking, strong differentiation. The uh, few neurons that are actually less left in the, um, in the PD case are further affected, so they are less complex. We can, as I said, recognize these neurons and then, for example, draw a skeleton that allows us to see how, man how often these neurons branch. And um, this degree of branching is reduced in the GBAPD situation. And the long axons that are still there are often pretty much fragmented, which is a sign of early degeneration. Taking all that into account, we can also measure um, activity by putting them on multi-electrode arrays because you know, neural activity at the end of the day is nothing else than electric, electric activity. So we just place them on top of some electrodes and then measure how much they fire. And uh, indeed we can see that the neurons in GBAPD are less active than those in the healthy control conditions. What was a bit of a surprising uh, finding is that um, the levels of TH, like of this enzyme that actually produces dopamine per neuron seem to be higher in GBAPD than in the control situation. 
You see here the uh, TH staining again, and in the control, you see lots of neurons, very complex morphology, high degree, high degree of branching in the neurites. While in the GBAPD, there's way less cells, but these cells seem to be fully loaded with TH. Um, and you also can see how, how under complex they look. So you basically have this long, one long projection and pretty much that's it. Um, that might be an attempt of those neurons to actually compensate for their loss. Um, so to, that the few cells that are there would produce more dopamine to, to compensate for the loss of the others. But that could be a vicious cycle because overproduction of dopamine would increase the stress level and then probably also put them to degeneration at a later stage. So to further understand then why these cells are actually degenerate, we uh, did a gene expression analysis and um, from the differentially expressed genes, we constructed networks. Um, you see one of those gene expression networks here on the left side. And what you can see is um, genes that are typically involved in differentiation, like TH or RET would be downregulated. So they have this blue circle, while stem cell genes like um, SOX2 and GRAIL or LMX1 would actually be upregulated. And we can recapitulate or, or, or verify this nicely in an immune fluorescent staining approach. Like you see SOX2 in the control forms this very distinct, very specific structure, which resembles uh, a neural niche in many aspects. While in the GBAPD, uh, pretty much all cells express SOX2. And if you were to do a co-staining, you would see that many of them on top express neural markers. So they seem to be kind of a bit confused actually in their identity, what they actually would want to become. Um, and then finally, to, to um, go deeper into the molecular mechanism, we looked whether probably these um, persistence of stem cell markers and probably continued cycling would lead to actually premature aging or senescence. And that seems to be the case. We use here staining for a marker called lamin B1, which is high in uh, control cells, but downregulated in um, GBAPD case, indicating that these, um, these cells in in GBAPD actually undergo premature aging or even senescence at a relatively early stage of development. And you can imagine that during normal brain development or during brain development when a GBAPD mutation is, is there, if these cells even eventually would undergo uh, dopaminergic neuron differentiation probably later than in the control, but they would be already premature aged so they would be probably already uh, are predisposed for degeneration at later stages bringing a very high risk factor in there. So just to summarize that part, um, I, I think I've shown you that GBAPD has a strong neurodevelopmental component with an impaired ability of the neural progenitors to efficiently differentiate, uh, which goes hand in hand with a premature aging. So the question is obviously, is that now very, very specific for GBAPD or do we see that also in other cases? Now we'll very quickly go about a second study, which has exactly the same setup. Uh, so we start from the individual, go through the stem cells towards the midbrain organoids, but we here would do that with um, organoids that have a triplication of the alpha synuclein gene. And uh, what we would see here is, first of all, we indeed have alpha synuclein pathology, like um, the levels of alpha synuclein are higher, there's more phosphor alpha synuclein, and this is visible at pretty much all stages of differentiation, and also the uh, secretion of alpha synuclein can be nicely seen. And this indeed goes hand in hand with the loss of dopaminergic neurons. Like uh, here's again a staining for TH as a dopaminergic neuron marker. At early stages of differentiation, as I said before, at day 30, we don't have any significant effects. Remember the GBAPD patients already have lost quite a lot of dopaminergic neurons here. For the alpha synuclein patients, this is not the case. You can see there's probably even for some individuals a tendency to have more um, to have more dopaminergic neurons, like these three data points here, have very clearly more. While at day 70, um, there's a reduction, so we would have a strong degeneration um, and a strong loss of dopamine production. So not to go to any all single mutations, I just want to show you that we see same things in uh, PD with the mutation on LARC2, as well as in PINK1. And importantly, we are not the only ones seeing that. Um, there is a paper very nice from Sang Hun Yi's lab where he, did, where he has very similar observations in cases of DNA JC6. So we have now these, all this phenotyping. We can find PD associated or PD relevant uh, defects in these midbrain organoids. Can we now use that for drug development? And um, so I've shown you already um, this study here on the right side where we have the mutation in PINK1. 
And there we actually tested a compound that activates the autophagy process. And that allows us to rescue the loss of dopaminergic neurons to quite some extent. And um, there's a second study that is done together with uh, Reiko Krüger's lab here in Luxembourg. Um, he has patients that have a mutation in the DJ1 gene and they develop compounds that affect the molecular mechanism that is, that is, um, that is addressed in these patients. And indeed, if we treat midbrain organoids with this compound, um, we see a full rescue of the amount of dopaminergic neurons. So um, we're quite confident that this is a very nice model system now to really conduct drug screening, drug testing, and um, to come up with um, therapeutic candidates for PD. Um, so far, everything that I've shown you looks like that it's a very developmental model. It looks like very early during brain development. However, I want to show you some evidences that um, this probably allows also to mimic what's happening in the aged brain. This is a study that has been conducted together with uh, Nobutaka Hattori at Yontendo University in Tokyo. And uh, they had the un unique situation that they had post-mortem brain samples from uh, three individuals that had Parkinson's and that had a mutation in the Parkin gene. And what they saw in the post-mortem brain samples is these individuals had less staining for GFAP and nesting. These are stainings for astrocytes and they can confirm that also in Western blocks. So what they concluded is um, patients with a Parkin mutation have less astrocytes. And the unique thing is now that from two of these three patients where they had the brains, they also had the stem cells. So they gave us those stem cells. We constructed midbrain organoids from them and we see exactly the same. Like you see here, the healthy individual having lots of astrocytes, this is a GFAP staining quantified here. While then the patient has severely reduced levels of astrocytes in the dish. Like what he saw in a post-mortem brain sample, so of an individual probably at the age of 60, we can see uh, in the midbrain organoids after two months of culture. So it really recapitulates the pathology. And Jens, can you just yeah. clarify what astrocytes are for the audience, please? Sure. Um, astrocytes are support cells. Like um, our brain is not just, just neurons. Um, it is actually more support cells than neurons. Um, so they, for example, take care that the neurons get nutrition, they are part of the synapse, so they remove uh, neurotransmitters, they shield the brain against the outside, so have all kinds of functions, um, they're probably as important as neurons. Okay, so that's the age brain. Um, so still, we have um, all kinds of different cells in those midbrain organoids, and we now wanted to analyze that in more detail. And what we conducted there is a so-called single cell RNA sequencing. So um, we, we, we sequence the, um, the, the gene activity in each of the cells of the, of the organoids. And what you see here in this color-coded map is that every dot is a cell and every color is an identity. Like for example, these green cells down here on the right side are um, astrocytes again. And if we do that, what we can find is that the neurons that we have in the midbrain organoids are not only dopaminergic neurons, but we also have GABAergic, glutamatergic, and even a few serotonergic neurons. However, what we also see is everything that is not coming from the ectoderm is missing. So our brain is not only cells from developmentally the ectoderm, like not only neurons and astrocytes, but it also has uh, immune cells called microglia, and it has vasculature, like blood cells or blood vessels. And these, in our approach, we would not have. And that's a huge limitation. So particular microglia, it's, I think it's very obvious, they play a huge role in neuroinflammation in, in pretty much all disease-associated processes. Um, this is not specific to Parkinson's, this is also in Alzheimer's and probably any other neurodegenerative disorder, they will play a huge role. And vasculature is obviously an important aspect, particularly when it comes to the blood-brain barrier. So you can probably develop the nicest therapeutic on earth if you don't manage to get it to the brain, it's probably not very helpful. So we have to also model these aspects to really use them for drug development. And in the last part of the presentation, I would like to focus then on the microglia. So microglia um, have immune functions that I've already mentioned. So they present the antigens, uh, they produce chemokines and cytokines, they do phagocytosis, like they, they, they eat up uh, bacteria, for example, or any other kinds of pathogens. Um, they can undergo aging, they have also quite a bit of developmental function, like they take away, for example, synapses that are not active, they do trophic support, and they are also part of the blood-brain barrier. So as I said, normally our brain organoids unfortunately don't have microglia. So um, in order to, to, to fix that problem, 
um, a student from my team spent some time in uh, Sally Cowley's lab at Oxford University because they just developed a process where you can go from stem cells to um, macrophage precursor cells. And microglia are actually nothing else than the macrophages of the brain. So we adapt this protocol and we can now produce quite nicely these macrophages and macrophage precursors in the lab. You see here, they express a marker called IBO1 um, and also others like PU1, and they express also these other markers here. So they seem to be proper microglia cells. And um, if we put them in culture, they do what microglia should do, namely the phagocytose. Like um, we here treat them with, with particles called zymosan. They are labeled with these red fluorescence. And then if we, if we leave the cells with these particles for a while and then do imaging and image reconstruction, you can see that these red dots here really end up within the cell, indicating that they're really phagocytosing. And if you play this video here, you can also really see that in life, like the cells are chasing these uh, green particles here and really take them up. So um, we, we have the microglia or macrophages in the dish that seem to be functional. Um, the problem is now, how do we get these macrophages into the brain? And um, we developed now their protocol where we would start with um, a, sa a single stem cell line. And uh, on the one end, we do what I've described in the first parts of the talk, like we produce these midbrain organoids, but then in parallel from the same line, we produce the macrophage precursors. And then very simply, we ju just put them on top and let them migrate in. Um, that sounds pretty simple, but um, unfortunately, the organoids need a certain medium to survive, particularly as dopaminergic neurons, and the macrophages need another one. And whatever seems good for the macrophages seems to be bad for the neurons and vice versa. So it, it took us probably about two years to find media conditions that allow that all cell types survive. But now we are there, that's fine. Uh, we can do that. And um, so this is then how it looks like in the end. So we have developed this protocol. I'm not going into details here, but what you can see is that we can produce now these midbrain organoids with macrophages or with microglia. We call these assembloids because it's an assembly of different cell types. And you can see that an assembloid would, for example, include uh, IBO1, it's a macrophage marker, uh, would include FOXA2, or TH as dopaminergic neuron markers. If we quantify that, um, it's about 6.1, 6.2% of all cells at the end of the day are macrophages or microglia. And this is very similar to what we see in the human brain. To further understand these cells, um, we conducted again uh, single cell sequencing. So same thing as before, every dot is an individual cell. And you see that the midbrain organoids MO here look very similar to the assembloids except this tiny little population down here. Uh, and this is actually the microglia. So this pinkish or, or light red population, which you only see in the assembloids and not in the midbrain organoids. So we are very specific, uh, this particular population now present in a hierarchical clustering of the gene expression data. Um, you can see that the uh, MGL, like the microglia, cluster totally away from all the other cell types. So they come from a different lineage. It's really a different cell type. And they um, express all the genes that we would expect from them to be expressed, like uh, the microglia core signature. These are genes that really define their identity. They express the genes that are important for phagosomal activity, like so that they really can conduct uh, phagocytosis. Um, we can see lots of genes from uh, the chemokine and cytokine panel to be present only in the microglia, not in the other cell types. And it's not only that they express the genes, here on the right side, you see really the release of the genes measured in ELISA. Um, you see that the different assembloids have um, high levels of these chemokines and cytokines, which we typically would not find in the midbrain organoids. Um, probably, I, I'm not getting in all the details here. It's a little bit of a busy slide. Uh, but what you can see here is we looked at a bunch of different genes for synapses. And interestingly, uh, pretty much all synaptic genes are affected, and most of them are downregulated in the midbrain organoids. Um, and this goes back to what I told you before, that uh, microglia are important for synaptic pruning. So they actually shape the synaptic tree, and we are speculating that probably if we add microglia to the assembloids, the uh, synaptic makeup of those assemblages would change. That seems to be the case on the gene expression level as well as on the protein level. And... Um, we can even then confirm that by um, multi-electrode arrays uh, and, and patch clamping. Like if we patch individual cells 
we see that the action potential threshold is reduced. Um, that means that neurons that are in the in the neighborhood of microglia have a lower action potential threshold, so they are more likely to fire, um, while um, assembloids on a multi-electrode array have a higher, um, have a shorter interspike interval, so they're firing more often than midbrain organoids would do. All in all, that um, basically tells us, <laughs> sorry, that basically tells us that um, synaptic activity in assembloids is higher than it would be in the midbrain organoids. Just to conclude that, um, so we can include microglia in the midbrain organoids now having kind of an assembloid system that leads to uh, increased neural functionality. And I haven't shown you the data on actually um, reduced oxidative stress as well as reduction of cell death. So the whole model becomes more healthy and more functional. Um, so final thing is obviously I would like to, to thank all the people involved in that work. Um, here on the left side, the large picture is my team at the University of Luxembourg. Some of those people by now have uh, migrated into the company actually. Um, on the right side, uh, there's all kinds of collaboration partners and supporters. We're very grateful as well as to the funding here. And well, probably the most important thing, if you have you know, a tar target molecule, a small molecule, a biologic, a virus, you think it could be relevant for Parkinson's therapeutics, um, happy to get in touch. Probably we can test it in the midbrain organoids and really make use of this model to come up with new and effective therapeutics. And with that, I would be very happy to take any kind of questions. Thanks for your attention. Thank you so much. Fantastic. So we've got a few questions. I'll start. Um, one just came in from the audience. Can you clarify if in the case of the GBA PD model, if the differentiation in dopamine dopaminergic neurons is impaired, or if the dopaminergic neurons are you know normally generated and then there's subsequent degeneration? Are you able to tell that? Yeah, it's both. Um, we see there is a very clear uh, differentiation phenotype. Differentiation is impaired, but we can also see that those dopaminergic neurons that are produced um, and look probably normal for, for a short while in their lifespan um, are more likely to degenerate at later stages. So we have also higher degrees of specific apoptosis or other mechanisms of cell death in dopaminergic neurons. So both plays a role. I would guess that um, particularly these um, premature aging that happens there really predispose them for degeneration later. Okay. And then sort of a second part of that question is, you know, obviously if there's a developmental component, any thoughts about how this might actually be addressed pharmacologically? That would go, I mean, it's necessary then really to have um, really diagnosis. For the GBAPD, probably this is very easy with gene testing, right? Because this is a simple sequence. Uh, this can be tested quite quite nicely. Um, the good thing is that the motor symptoms really only occur when 50% of the neurons are lost. So if you could really diagnose that early enough, I think that there is a huge window of intervention that could be used. Right. So another question that came in was, you know, obviously we had limited time today and you talked about some of the organoids from genetic mutations. Have you looked at just, you know, Parkinson's patients that don't have any genetic mutations to see if you can recapitulate any of these things? Yeah, that's probably the most interesting or important. The genetic are, are kind of the entry, but uh, the huge population of patients are idiopathic. Um, so we, we started some work on that. We can recapitulate also phenotypes in some of those, not in all. Um, and it makes sense that it's not in all. So it's somebody who has, for example, Parkinson's, but has it purely because he has been um, exposed to high doses of, of toxins during his life. We will never be able to recapitulate that in vitro. But I think the majority of the idiopathic patients have actually a, a very complex genetic signature that contributes to disease. And this we can model. And uh, this is sort of a question from me. I don't know if you've been able to get this far yet, but obviously there's sort of different flavors of Parkinson's. People can have different sort of subtypes. Is that anything that you've been able to look at or any interest in looking at is why some people have a more aggressive course or maybe they have more of this clinical feature versus that? Yeah, that's what you see. Like if you compare, for example, the GBA and the alpha synuclein data, right? GBA seems to be way more aggressive. You see it much earlier while alpha synuclein comes way later. So at that, um, for, at that level or to that extent, we can model it. Really directly linking it to clinical phenotype would be probably too much of a stretch. Okay. Um, and then you. you wanna go, Martina? Yeah, there's one that just came in, uh, another question uh, from Elkat. 
uh, he says, brilliant presentation, are the lead brain organoids taking two months to develop? And uh, so if, if that's the case, how long for yes to fill in? Can you probably re repeat the question? I'm not sure whether I 100% understand. Yeah, just the, like, the midbrain organoids are taking roughly two months to, to develop. Um, is the, uh, are the assemblies taking any longer or the, what, ah. what is the, the duration okay. of the differentiation of the assemblies? Yeah, I see. Um, so we can differentiate them for the midbrain organs. We can differentiate them for, for a long time, if you like. Like I mentioned that a bit more than 400 days, if it's necessary. Um, it really depends on which aspect you want to look at. If you want to purely look at the dopaminergic neurons, typically a month or two is sufficient. If you want to look at the astrocytes, you would differentiate them longer because they come later. Um, and the assembloids typically take a bit longer because we first produce the organoids and then mix in the microglia. So normally they are probably about 20 days older than the corresponding midbrain organoids would be. Thank you. Um, and we got just another one question that just came in. Um, Bridget asks, have you considered making organoids of isogenic control such as CRISPR editing and repairing the GBA1 mutations in the patient? Uh, IPSC line to investigate the effect of your therapeutics since the genetic factor is such an important factor for PD. Yeah, this is this is a very interesting question, and uh, we spent a lot of time on that. Um, when we initially started, we really heavily focused on uh, CRISPR editing and producing isogenic controls or introducing the mutation in uh, healthy cells. Um, based on everything that we have learned over the years, I would not do that again um, because um, the point mutations like in GBA and LARC, um, they certainly have a contribution, but they only are disease causing in a certain genetic background. Like um, the LARC2 G2019S, people who have that mutation, only 30% of the people who have the mutation get the disease. 70% are completely unaffected. So um, I, I think we, we need the really complex genetic makeup. It's really the mutation in the context of the rest of the genetics. That means um, if I produce an isogenic line where I introduce a mutation or correct it, I will, this is perfect if you really want to understand what is the mutation doing. If you want to understand the disease, I would say it's pretty useless. Um, that's why we don't do that anymore. Thank you. Um, I think like something else uh, I, I just wanted to ask. So you work with uh, patient-derived lines. Um, so... Where, where are these patient derived lines coming from? Is these patients that you're seeing um, and, and institutions that you work with or um, how, how do you get the lines and how do you uh, choose which patients? Yeah, from, from wherever we can. Um, yeah. So we have, uh, we have agreements with, with several um, academic institutions from um, where we can get lines. Uh, we also use biobanks that are um, that publicly uh, make those those lines available. Obviously, it always um, is only possible if uh, the patients have given the consent that their lines can be used for this kind of work. And uh, we also have to have the um, ethics permit here from the uh, from the national ethics board um, that allows us to to do these experiments. So we have to declare everything and has to be controlled. Um, but luckily, there is by now qu quite a good source of those cell lines available. Thank you. And we had another question come in. Um, so isn't SNCA triplication associated with early onset Parkinson's where GBA tends to be more later onset? So how, how do you reconcile that with the, the differences that we see with a more aggressive disease progression in the organoids or at least yeah. the loss? Um, I think particular for the uh, for the triplication, it's very hard to say because we have very, very few patients. Um, so the, the statistics basis to really make a statement on that is probably quite thin. And then that's one of the things that I guess I mentioned earlier. Um, it is a nice model, but it, it will always stay a model. So we can recapitulate certain aspects in the dish, but uh, obviously not the full spectrum of what happens in the patient. Yep, absolutely. Um, I think those are all the questions we have. If anybody else has any other questions please let them in. I'm looking to see if there's anything else. Yeah. I have one question while we wait. Um, 
Jens, and this is the cell biologist in me, but I'm I'm just I know you shared you shared very nicely the um the the um the graph of uh, the scatter plot of the uh, single cell RNA sequences before and mm -hmm. after adding microglia. I'm just wondering if you looked uh, at the astrocytes a little closer and if you see any differences in their expression profile when you add microglia or when microglia is not there. Actually, not in that study. There, we pretty much really focused on uh, what are the microglia doing to the neurons. Uh, but you're right; it's it's an interesting question, particularly for the uh, immune modulation function yeah. that astros might have. Yeah, no, the, we have not studied that intensively enough. Yeah. Okay. No, that that's. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, yeah. yeah. The reason why I ask is exactly what you said for our audiences. Astrocytes and, and microglia interact and 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 talk to each other in the brain, and so um, it'll be just very interesting to know what changes yeah. in astrocytes. Um, I think particularly like the technologies now coming up with spatial transcriptomics, that's yeah. going to be amazing. Like if we can really compare what what's it, how the transcriptome changes if two cells are sitting next to each other versus being far away from each other, that's going to be fantastic. Looking forward to yeah. that. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great point. Um, I, oh, go ahead, Martina. I was just going to say, I think we're all done with the questions, unless Jamie, you have any pressing question. Uh, yeah. we can... One more. So, you know, Obviously, the goal would be to understand some of the, the basic mechanisms of disease, but also look for therapeutic targets. So is this something that you guys are actively doing? It sounds like you are. And then if so, if you identify something, what's the next step? Where where do you take that? You know, is it, do you go to another animal model? Do you take it, you know, where? Yeah. Um, so at the moment, we we have some some drug candidates um, and we're screening for more. Um we pretty much go for, I would even call it a classical drug development cycle, uh, like we would basically <clears throat> do uh, medicinal, medicinal chemistry on those, get get better models, get them more efficient, um, and then further develop them. Um, I think for certain aspects, even these days, we would still go have to go through animal models. We would like to keep them as little as possible, because particularly for Parkinson's, they're probably not very predictive. Um, and then, yeah, obviously the, the aim is to to bring therapeutics into clinical testing and then eventually to towards the patients. Fantastic. Yeah, and sorry, <laughs> I have a follow-up. Um, and so is the aim, you're using patient-derived lines, so is the aim to kind of understand what therapeutics are targeted uh, for which patients and then this will probably lead to better uh, design of clinical trials? Is that what you're also trying to, to do in your yeah. own? Yeah, what I think is um, with the genetic models that we are now heavily using, we've kind of uh, defined subgroups uh, and then the idiopathics will probably fall into these subgroups. I would imagine that at the end of the day, we probably come up with 10, 20 different subgroups and the different subgroups probably get different therapeutics. And well, if I would then consider that this works and then we probably have 20 Parkinson's medications on the market I would say that the future looks like that um, probably in a personalized medicine approach somebody is diagnosed uh, probably gets his midbrain organoids produced all 20 drugs are produced tested on the organoids and then they only get the one prescribed that is really working like I don't know if you have a headache probably for your aspirin works while for somebody else's paracetamol and currently we actually test that in the individual which sounds like a bit stone age uh, we could do that probably in the future in, in in vitro in the dish and then yeah just only give the compound that really works yeah that sounds awesome thank you um so i think we're all done with the questions um and if we have no further question from the panelists i just want to thank you again gents this was fascinating work it really incredible um thank so you. thank you so much for giving us your time and thank you for uh, to everybody that attended the seminar um this seminar is recorded um so we will uh put a recording online um and if you have other questions please uh email us and and we'll do our best to answer them thank you Thanks so much bye-bye